Hello, my dear friends, my lovely audience. Welcome to the East West Show. Check Chow on the East West with GNE TV. Uh, today, with my good friend, a big icon friend, former presidential advisor for both George Bush 41 and George Bush 43, and also former spokesman for California, former governor uh, Pete Wilson. And he is now founder and the CEO of uh, Lee Strategy Consultation. So, sir, welcome to the show. Always good to be here, Jack. Thank you very much. And you know my rule. You know my rule. I said it uh, uh, several times. When there is a crying baby, I bring the crying baby to the mother or the father, or whoever. Right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> In this case, you are the father of the crying baby. The crying baby be the fact that uh, we are Americans quite confused with the situation that is uh, happening in as the consequence or aftershock of the Sh Charlottesville event or incident. But prior to that, over this weekend, we heard, we all heard it's cross the nation about a disaster, a devastating disaster for first for the past 500 years for uh, uh, Katrina Harvey that hits uh, Texas whole center Texas probably Houston, whatever, Austin area, stuff like that. And it's so devastating. And yet, on the, uh, uh, to the contrary, the Donald Trump this time gets a lot of credit, and lots of people give very, very nice uh, appraisal about his uh, response. Not only he responded early, he n even did something beforehand and get things ready, and he was planning to go there. So I'd like to, uh, before we go to Charlottesville Eastern, I would like to start with you by giving some comment about uh, Trump, please. Well, well, I mean, Hurricane Harvey, like any other natural disaster, is a mm -hmm. prime opportunity for any president to kind of show their chops in terms of the ability of the federal government to respond to mm -hmm. local aid. Um, the thing to remember about Hurricane Harvey is that Hurricane Harvey is a Category 2 hurricane. Compared to Hurricane Katrina, which was a Category 5, it's uh -huh. a it's a completely different type of I hurricane. See. But this morning they updated to four. <laughs> yeah, the 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 difficulty is that mm. uh, you know I mean Hurricane Katrina taught mm. frankly every president moving forward oh, how right. you ought to respond to a natural mm. disaster mm. like uh, like a hurricane uh, with uh, New Orleans and Houston uh, during Katrina being devastated mm -hmm. and you know frankly President Bush deserves some of the criticism in terms of FEMA's response to that. Mm -hmm. Ever since then there's been significant efforts to revamp the federal response and you know President Trump you know to his credit has always uh, put a big emphasis in terms of disaster response. I mean mm -hmm. right down during the campaign you know going down and handing out food and water um, in an incident down in the south mm -hmm. after a tornado. So. I think that uh, uh, natural disasters, unfortunately, uh, for the suffering that they inflict, they also provide prime opportunities for president to show that they are, in fact, doing the government's business. So, in that respect, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that uh, the the response to Harvey is a prime opportunity for the president to kind of reinforce I an see. image, at least that in this mm -hmm. one area, he's yeah, kind of yeah, getting yeah, it right. Uh -huh. In other words, it's not solely a character for Donald Trump himself, but also he learned from the past uh, presidencies, uh, starting Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, I mean, if you go that back, was 2005, if, yeah, right? if you go back to other uh, hurricanes, whether or not it was Andrew or Ivan or, or some of the others that we've had that have been really noticeable. I mean, the response, for example, with the hurricane that went up into uh, New Jersey and caused the flooding up there, and even mm -hmm. flooding out Wall Street. Um, each natural disaster teaches us lessons about response, preparedness, mm -hmm. and preparation. So I think that you know uh, we're never really going to be um, uh, really prepared for Mother Nature at her mm -hmm. worst, but uh, it does give us an opportunity to kind of fix what was broken and then kind of move forward. I see. But there's a little question. I remember there are lots of incidents when the uh, local government blaming the uh, federal for their uh, reluctancy or the reluctance in declaring emergency or, or whatever, give it color, color, color reading. Uh, but this time, uh, it's uh, reportedly said that uh, Donald Trump jumped on himself. So could that be another complaint? So from well, the governor's side, hey, before I say something, you, you, you jumped well, on already. You have to understand how declarations work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you have to first have a local declaration from municipal municipality like mm -hmm. a city mm -hmm. that goes to the state yeah the state then makes the declaration and then there's the request for federal aid 
Mm -hmm. uh, the way the law works is that the president himself doesn't like leapfrog to the front first. You've got to work from the local level up to the federal level. Uh -huh. Now, what the president can do and what presidents have done in the past is get things ready when they know like a hurricane oh, or natural disaster is coming. Mm -hmm. And that's why President Bush got a lot of criticism because the response planning and preparation for Katrina were pretty inadequate especially when you look at what happened at the uh, Superdome in uh, New Orleans, mm -hmm. where there were so many people that went there as an evacuation center, but there wasn't enough food, water, um, sanitation, supplies, mm -hmm. and medical personnel. So th that's an example where uh, the, the magnitude of the situation wasn't met by the planning. So since then, mm -hmm. uh, the federal government's done a much better job in mm -hmm. response. So back then, during your time, when you were with the uh, uh, Bush 43, uh, did you get any encounter with a situation like this with national disaster? Well, sure. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, Katrina was, you know, justifiably a black eye for the federal government at that mm -hmm. time, not just President Bush, but really for a lot of different federal agencies, especially FEMA. Um, and I, I think there was a lot of very serious soul searching and trying to fix what went wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, the Army Corps of Engineers took a lot of heat f uh, out of Katrina as well for the design of the levees, for example, that gave way. Yeah. Uh, so, uh -huh. you know, the, when you have a Category 5 hurricane, it's a once a century type of an event. So mm -hmm. those are the kind of situations that you really never expect to happen. Mm -hmm. And when they do, you're not prepared for it. So the lesson being that we should always be prepared for those. Okay, like this one, they say we can't, we can't even predict it now because uh, we never know how things will go. Well, Harvey was a little bit different because even mm -hmm. though it was a Category 4 hurricane, uh, it's dumping so much rain and it's mm -hmm. a very slow moving hurricane. So wow. in the case of Houston, for example, they've got 50 inches of rain in as little as 24 hours. So oh, wow. that's an enormous amount of water to have to mm -hmm. cope with. And mm -hmm. that p particular part of Texas, there's not a lot of drainage. It's just all flatland. So there's nowhere for the water to go. I see. So I that's see, part I of the see. problem. Yeah. And also, uh, if I sum up what, what, what you have stated so far, that e except the part of dec making a declaration, Donald Trump had his damn people, had his administration, even FEMA, motivated to get him prepared for that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the federal government, you know, doesn't even wait to, you know, they plan for this stuff and they run disaster preparedness drills and so forth. And, and we know hurricane season is going to come. And the one thing about the weather is that we can't predict a hurricane season. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, uh, we get things ready, you know, uh, in advance of all these different events that occur. And a quote unquote from Donald Trump says it's been there way before. Well, I mean, the, the one thing that... The, the effort, the efforts and uh, preparation. You have to say the one thing that President of the United States can do is that, you know, disaster relief is an executive action. Mm -hmm. So it's the one area where he doesn't have to ask Congress, he doesn't have to ask uh, you you know, Democrats, he can mm -hmm. just go ahead and do it himself. Uh, so it gives him uh, an opportunity to kind of like, you know, meet the basic demand. It's also, you know, disasters are a bipartisan opportunity. I mean, they're, mm. not, uh, they're not an opportunity for either party to take, you know, stands or take shots. I mean, you both want to do what's best for the people that are suffering. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a matter of fact, it's just such a good thing that he doesn't have to go through those partisanship going back and forth who tied each other all the time. Well, disaster reconstruction is going to be a partisan <laughs> affair because uh -huh. someone's going to have to write the check, and uh -huh. that, that's going to require supplemental appropriation by Congress. I see. But, but check, check number, the amount of dollars was set aside anyway in the previous co Congress or this Congress anyway, right? It just depends on the final bill. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the insurance companies will figure out how much they're mm -hmm. going to pay for. I'm sure there'll be a substantial amount of people that you know are, are going to need help rebuilding their homes. Uh, infrastructure, roads that are damaged, and so forth, schools and stuff like that that have to be re replaced or, re or repaired. So there, there's going to uh, be a, a final accounting f uh, as to yeah, yeah, what's yeah. going to be needed. You know, uh, I'm, uh, I believe my audience are, my folks are all worried about the folks over there because they're talking about 50 inches of, uh, of water overnight, like say 24 hours. That's quite a lot of water, like ocean there already. So for of course, it's in, in Mother Nature's act, right? It's uh, nobody's fault, right? If that happens, uh, do they get any help from, uh, I mean, financial help when this comes down? 
uh, from uh, federal money. Well, I mean, it, money. It, 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 there are various programs set up to go ahead and assist the municipalities and individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is a federal disaster declaration, for example, mm -hmm. federal money is available to help for relief and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, the first and primary uh, uh, source of relief for most people is frankly their, their insurance, uh, whether or not it's their car insurance, if the car got flooded, mm -hmm. or whether or not their house got wiped out, stuff like that. Um, in, in certain areas like Houston where you're on a coastal floodplain, um, you're supposed to have flood insurance, for example, which yeah, covers yeah, it, but not, 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 not a lot of people have it. Mm -hmm. So the federal government and the state government have to make decisions about what they will cover. And after all, the insurance business is also business, right? So on average year, they pay out a certain rate or whatever, they still well, do insurance the companies, business. you know, expect this stuff. So yeah, that's why they build it into no, the No, when permits. they are paying out, all, paying out all, everybody where there's supposed to be money, where does the money come from? Well, premiums. The premier so will cover that. Yeah, I mean, insurers, you know, know that these events are going to happen, so mm -hmm. they build it into their forecast and the projections and the reserves. I see, I see, I see. All right. Uh, well, well, folks, uh, you guys, I know lots of uh, you worried about folks in uh, Texas, especially in Houston area, where lots of friends, relatives of you is there. For example, me myself. My, my, my mother-in-law is there, so that's why I'm so more so worried. <laughs> I started the whole thing with, the, uh, with, with Harvey. Okay, and uh, once again, I'm talking about today we are uh, prepared. We're, we've prepared ourselves uh, for a uh, Donald Trump update with the, over the uh, Charlottesville incident, and we put this on top to make sure our folks uh, feel okay because you guys worry so much. We'll take a short moment now. When we come back, we'll continue from that point on to Charlottesville. Please stay with us. Hello, my dear friends, my dear audiences. Uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, we're talking about uh, Trump presidency of the date over the uh, Charlottesville uh, incident. Um, but on top of that, because of a Hurricane Harvey, we added up uh, uh, with one so segment they're talking about it because lots of folks uh, worry about it. On the other hand, the most important I put it on top is that uh, well, anybody, including Donald Trump, who does anything good, we've got to give him recognition. He does it. This time, he extra, extraordinarily did something outstanding, I believe. A part belongs to the fact, oh, by the way, he's been uh, doing business with FEMA for quite, quite some time. The news says. Uh, or his company or whatever, doing business with FEMA yeah, that, for that quite some time. With. And uh, learning from, uh, it's a, uh, his uh, experiences is also his a uh, character on character combined with uh, uh, lessons learned from uh, the previous uh, disasters, all right? So, so much for that. And joining me is my good friend, uh, Honorable James Lee. He is the former uh, president's uh, presidential advisor for George Bush, George H. W. W. Bush and George H. W. Bush, 41 and 43. And he was the former uh, spokesman for California, former governor P Pete Wilson, and he is now the founder and CEO of a strategy uh, consultation group. So, sir, welcome to back to the show. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for for saving us out of the worry so much. Oh, lots of flights are canceled today, this yeah. morning. Lots of flights are canceled. Anyway, let's keep our finger crossed and God bless. Uh, with the uh, Katrina Harvey, Trump took no time, waste no time, in in speaking up to coming down, to coming the situation down, to 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 massage the situation. Otherwise, you're talking about a huge, huge havoc. Right? So the same manner didn't apply to the fact when he responded to the Charlottesville incident. When those two fight, he took two days to say anything. How do you see the differences, please? Well, I mean, well, look, I mean, the difference between uh, Hurricane Harvey and, and Charlottesville are night and day. Hurricane Harvey, we knew what was going to happen because it's a hurricane. 
-hmm. and there are procedures and policies and agencies uh, you know, involved in, in that kind of response. Charlottesville is a local protest that ballooned into a national story. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, the president doesn't have any responsibility in terms of the actual response to Charlotte. That's a local law enforcement oh, issue. But you know, he certainly has to weigh in because it's a national uh, significant issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem that the president had in Charlottesville is pretty simple. He opened his mouth in a really inappropriate way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and there's there's frankly no excuse uh, for mm -hmm. defending or intimating that there's a moral equivalency between uh, you know uh, those who protest against fascist groups and those that are fascist groups. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you don't defend the KKK and neo Nazis. I don't care who you are or what you believe in. In today's society, it's just not done. It's a no no, mm -hmm. especially for the president of the United States. Now, our argument can be made that the president was trying to intimate that there's extremism on both sides, mm -hmm. and we need to be more civil society. There are. A million ways to say that better. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Than, <laughs> I than see he the point. Did. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, it, it was it was a really bad failure on his part in communicating. Mm -hmm. um, his original statements, where it was prepared and it was released and it was scripted, was frankly not a bad statement in terms of denouncing the violence and mm -hmm. hate groups and so forth. The problem was that he got on Twitter later and made it worse, where he started to muddy up the waters by um, making an equivocation on both sides. Yeah, all right. Now, the, the problem that the president has is simple. There is virtually nothing that President Trump can say mm -hmm. that is not going to get him in hot water right now because there are strong opposition to whatever he says. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a lose-lose situation for him in a lot of ways. Uh -huh. So uh, knowing that, uh, you know, the best course of action is to just basically, you know, um, make a short statement, let that statement stand, and then leave it alone. Uh, in his particular case, he can't leave it alone. Uh, because that just seems to be his personality. He is driven to have these Twitter debates with yeah, 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 yeah. almost anybody. Which and, is part of his life. And the unfortunate problem is that I, I think it, it harms his presidency, it harms his leadership, it harms his agenda, it mm. harms his ability to focus on other issues, and it gives more red meat to the people that oppose him. And uh, the, the, real, the real tragedy besides what happened in Charlottesville itself and the, and the woman that was killed mm -hmm. and the people that were injured, the, the, the political tragedy of all this is that what President Trump suffers through are basically self-inflicted wounds. I mean, the, the president has an uncanny ability to shoot himself in the foot. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a remarkable, uh, I, I don't know if I call it skill, but it's a remarkable uh, thing that he does where he finds the ability to say absolutely or tweet the absolutely wrong thing at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah, all right. That's a very, very amicable and I believe uh, reasonable comment. Uh, the reason I call you like emergency, sound like a much of your emergency was that I have done prior to you four shows all together. And it looks to me, everybody blames the other. Mm -hmm, sure. So left do the right and vice versa. Uh, even for the uh, white supremacies, there are some kind of uh, uh, defenses for that. Mm -hmm. First, the, it denying that existence, it existed, and so on and so forth. That's why I want to get you to you. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you have to understand that, mm -hmm. that you know, that, uh, what happened to Charlottesville wasn't just kind of like happening in a vacuum. I mean, we've been kind of building up to Charlottesville for a long oh, time. Oh, I see. I mean, you know, race relations in the United States are, are fraught with a lot of mistakes and a lot of uh, uh, bad decisions. I mm -hmm. mean, you could go back to the original history of the United States where we eradicated large portions of Native American populations, yeah. where mm -hmm. we passed the first Chinese exclusion yeah, laws, yeah. where we had the, yeah. uh, the Japanese American internment yeah. during World yeah. War II, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we had mass discrimination against immigrants coming through Ellis Island mm -hmm. and the Italians and the uh, Irish yeah, and so that. forth, uh -huh. uh, per persecution against Roman Catholics, uh, you know, w during mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy's time. I mean, and then obviously what happened with slavery, uh, mm -hmm. and then in post-Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement. And then you can even make the argument that, you know, the battles that lesbians and gays have been fighting in America. The fact of the matter is that um, race relations in the United States have always been complicated. Mm 
Hmm. And part of the reason is that you know, the United States is a very open society. We allow pretty much everyone to come into the c in this country. Mm -hmm. And depending on which wave of immigrants you come in, uh, you know, you're, you're usually not well economically established or educated or have careers and you start at the bottom of the barrel. Now, the great thing about America is that you work your way up. But, you know, the difficulty is that, you know, we live in a society right now where there are so many haves and have-nots. There is a great economic disparity. And that economic disparity, in, in a lot of ways, doesn't really recognize uh, racial lines. For example, if you look at who elected Donald Trump, it was primarily disenfranchised, uh, lower middle income whites that were mm -hmm. uh, that were really hurt by the mortgage meltdown yeah. and never were able to recover economically mm -hmm. and they were extremely disenfranchised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know you, then you look at President Obama's term for example where race was a most definite part of his presidency which mm -hmm. was uh, obviously unavoidable. The opposite way. The opposite way. Well he was obviously the first black uh, president mm -hmm. and so starting from the beer summit you know with uh, with a cop and a professor, and then moving all the way through, and then you go through what recently has happened with police shootings, Black Lives Matter movement, and so forth. Yes. Racial tensions have been extremely high. Yeah. And now, in, in, in when you get to Charlotte, uh, the difficulty now is that you know we have so many terms that fly through the air: alt left, alt right, uh, <laughs> neo Nazis, fascists. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. You know, socialist uh, extremists. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, you know, the, the, is, the uh, labels really, frankly, to most Americans don't mean a heck of a lot anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, what does mean a lot to a lot of people is um, a, a, I think there's a, there's a large weariness in America mm -hmm. about having these battles. Um, and I think for a lot of people who thought that after the 60s and 70s with the civil rights movement that we had moved beyond that. Um, you know, electing the first African American president, for example, was a huge milestone. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that the difficulty right now is that 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 battle over race has now been caught up into the issue of people who are trying to oppose President Trump's agenda, mm -hmm. where they kind of try to tie him to some of these uh, racist groups and to try to make the claim that well he's a racist. Yeah, and it's yeah, yeah. it's not dissimilar to the effort that. Uh, was made to try to tie him to Russia, for example, mm -hmm. to a point now that you know if there is a, you know a a Russian tenant in one of his buildings that's tied in as Russian collusion, to the same extent that if the president, you know, makes a statement that you know um, the alt right and the conservatives mm -hmm. are just as justified in fighting for free freedom of speech and also the dance of the KKK, mm -hmm. that's perceived as being a racist comment. And, and the problem is that we have, we, there's so little room to maneuver in the middle now in America, uh -huh. and social media and cable news feeds into this kind of hysteria, mm -hmm. that I think we're at a point now where I'm not really sure if we could kind of walk ourselves back from the ledge. You look at what happened in Berkeley last night and in other cities around where there are yeah, mass yeah, protests, yeah, yeah. where protesters now are, are, are gearing up for uh, protests, not to actually protest anything, but to try to start a fight on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's a real problem. Now, there are some cooler heads out there that are trying to have a dialogue about this, but mm -hmm. they're frankly too f few and far between right now. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that's a very sober-minded comment. I respect that. I respect that a lot. I believe my audience, that you don't want to miss that. I will turn this into writing, put it on the magazine. And later, if you miss it, you can still uh, read it. That's very important, a very thorough, very profound analysis about what's happening. So let's take a very short moment now. When we come back, we'll go step one step forward to see how we want to do, what we, what we can do. And is it a curable or not a curable? Is it where, where we are heading, stuff like that? Lots and lots and lots of questions being asked, uh, or at least I'm being bothered. So stay with us, we'll be right back. Hello, my dear friends, my lovely folks, uh, my fellow Americans, welcome back uh, to the show. Uh, with me today is my good friend, a big friend to the community, a supporter, the backbone, uh, former presidential governor for George H.W. Bush, George George Bush, and I mean 41 and 43, 
and also former governor spokesman for Pete Wilson for California and the founder and CEO for uh, Lee Strategy Consultation Group. And uh, this is Mr. O Honorable Mr. James, uh, James Lee, so one welcome back to the show. I do understand that we have lots of problems. I do appreciate the fact that you confirmed that the uh, white supremacies or discriminations or slavery concept or even whatever confederation, those stuff, uh, has never diminished. They are still there. And only given some environment, some kind of, kind of clim cl climate, they come back. And people are showing some efforts to connect President Trump with those. So should that be the case, should that not be the case, is one thing. However, we see the same rebound from the same, I mean, the, other, the opposite side anyway. So it looks to me that we are, as a nation, so divided. Have we ever been in history so divided like this? Sure. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, please, please. I feel, I feel better if you say that, please. Yeah, I mean, Have look, we ever been, you, and how later we overcame? Look, every baby boomer could go back to uh, the 60s, uh, the Watts riots, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, mm -hmm. when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, mm -hmm. when Mar Malcolm X was assassinated. Uh, Rosa, Rosa Park. Yeah, so. I mean, look, you know, race relations in the 60s in the United States were bad. Mm -hmm. uh, you had Bull Connor, uh, you know, the Selma March. Uh, you had, you know, water cannons and, and police dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, Thankfully, I don't think we're ever going to go back to that period. Mm -hmm. So you might argue that was kind of like the low watermark of race relations, you know, in, in America. Uh, so I don't think we're, we're anywhere near uh, where we were there. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, right now we have, you know, African-American congressmen and, and African-American governors and African-American, you know, mayors and so forth. So I think that there's been a, a marked improvement in, in those areas. Um, I, I do think that the basic problem is is that President Trump can do much more to settle a lot of these issues for mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. by simply making the simple denunciation of you know these hate groups and then leaving it at that. Uh, but the problem is that the president seems to have this desire to split hairs and mm -hmm. to make the differences between the KKK and yeah, you, conservatives, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a split here. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the more that you argue about the fine shade of degree between one group versus another group, mm -hmm. uh, the more that you end up lumping the two together unintentionally. And I think yeah, that that's right, what the president okay. has done, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, just like, you know, when he tries to attack um, the left and progressives, you know, when, you know, the left has issues where at every international conference or whatever, there are anarchists that go around burning police cars and smashing windows yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the left, you know, obviously does not identify that small segment with the entire movement. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what's happening on the, on the right, that this kind of lumping together effect, you know, mm -hmm. goes on all the time. So I he think he could have done it if he didn't do that. Well, you know, I mean, the, the problem is that, you know, as president of the United States, you want to set an example. You want to set the national dialogue, and you want to go ahead and and provide a pathway for Americans to to follow out of this mess. That is what your role ought to be. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is, though, President Trump has failed to do that because. He's insisted on having the debate not on the, the broader issues and the broader merit, a, a discussion about race or, or economics or geopolitics, but mm -hmm. he's having it in this one small area in terms of trying to differentiate the right. And, and that is, that's a problematic discussion. He's never gonna win that. After all, it's good to learn that in history, we had periods or time that is uh, likely like that. I mean, they're similar like this or even worse like this that will indicate that we once had the ability to overcome it, we can still do it again, right? But now, yeah. what is the cure? Where lies the cure that we want to overcome it? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I think that there's been a lot of progress since, for example, the Ferguson uh, riots that, that mm -hmm. occurred several years ago in Missouri. Uh, police departments nationwide have worked aggressively to try to mitigate and respond to, this, to the issue of, like, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. shootings of, unarmed black uh, men and women. Yeah. For example, the installation of body cameras on most police departments mm -hmm. now, uh, retraining of officers, uh, you know, changes in police procedures and policy. I mean, if you look back within the last 18 months, 
um, you know, there have, there's been a sharp decrease in the amount of shootings. Now, a lot of, some conservatives will say that's just because the police aren't enforcing the By law the way, anymore. Uh, uh, just a little insertion. Does that mean, does that mean, or does that taste like that, uh, the Ferguson cases, the Michael Brown cases, mm -hmm. that were the mis misjustified? Can we say that? Well, I mean, uh, the investigations, the investigations still have to go ahead and proceed. I mean, several of those cases are still moving through the court system. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, I know in the Baltimore case, the officers were exonerated um, after that; they were found not guilty. So, mm. uh, you know, I think where you're going to see is that um, there's a legal standard that the courts have to adhere to, and departments have to adhere to, but there's also a perception standard. And where police departments and police officers engaged in this activity might be acquitted, they're not going to be acquitted on the perception part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fight where you know police departments and communities have to come together, work together to do a better job. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll give you an example. After the LA riots in '92, mm -hmm. after the Rodney King incident, yeah, the Rodney King, four of the officers. Yeah, the the officers were exonerated on state charges, but they were convicted convicted on federal civil rights charges, but the, the lasting work, the hard work, what didn't end with the convictions, it had to do with the retooling of the police department. And the LA Police Department has made dramatic changes from where mm -hmm. it used to be, where it was primarily a white uh -huh. police officer force, uh -huh. where now the majority of officers, over 50%, are now minority. Mm -hmm. That women now make up one third of the LAPD. So that's really kind of created a sea change Mm -hmm. Now, is the LAPD perfect? Of course not. But you you move that dial a little bit further down the road when you start making these changes. And I think that is where we're at right now in terms of that, that mm -hmm. debate in America. Mm -hmm. So Charlottesville didn't help us in that we moved from talking about police, now we're talking about the president and whether yeah, or not he's a racist. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think the president didn't help himself mm -hmm. in trying to, to set that debate on a better yeah. Only, only made it even worse. Yeah. The reason I'm asking is that uh, I really look for a cure. I really don't want to continue seeing the United States like this. That's what. That's not what, what I came here for 34 years ago, right? So yeah. if th there is a cure, uh, after hearing your statement, I came to a, uh, a feeling that uh, I'm not saying that we're trying to overturn the verdict, whatever, for all the previous cases. I'm saying all I'm trying to say, trying to think, is that later when we come across some cases with a color sensitive, whatever thing, we really have to be careful. Is that a le lesson to learn? Well, yeah, I mean, like, the problem is that, you know, it's so easy for... Starting with a Martin Trimont, well, Trimont Martin. It's, Martin it's so stuff. easy for um, uh, opposing people, opposing sides, right now, to just kind of throw the word racism around loosely. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's lost a lot of currency uh, and a lot of weight and impact when people just call other people racist right out right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that's a little bit of, of a problem from the social media standpoint in that we blast each other so easily now and, and not have any kind of concrete conversations about anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the one thing that you would might find mo most Democrats and Republicans both agree on is. I think everyone believes that Donald Trump, uh, the president, should should give up his Twitter feed. <laughs> so no, okay, okay. so that, that might kind of get it started yeah, also in the Also, there is right one direction. thing that from uh, from national security concern. Well, sure. I mean, you know, there, there are a lot of legitimate reasons why mm. the president should should not be tweeting anymore yeah, yeah, and, yeah, okay. and stick to the mm. more traditional uh, uh, press release and speech mm. every once mm. in a while. But, you know, I, I think on a, on a more philosophical level, I think the thing that, that is most disturbing, distressing about where we are in America right now is that no, no one is willing to accept anyone else's point of view, no matter, All right, okay, okay. No matter what your point of view is. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that if you're a ardent anti-fascist, you have to see the point of view of a KKK person. That probably is never going to happen. Mm -hmm. But at the very least, you know, for example, let's take for example the Confederate uh, monuments. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a there was a really wonderful editorial in the LA Times this weekend about a young African American woman who was actually descended from a Confederate uh, soldier's family, mm -hmm. and she remarked about how 
you know, those monuments and statues represented not only her family legacy, but also a legacy of racism. Mm -hmm. And while she understood, um, you know, why a lot of Southerners would want those monuments to stay up, mm -hmm. she also recognized that you could simply take them down and just move them into a museum mm -hmm. where you could try to find a compromise. And I think that that kind of uh, rational debate is what we need in America right now, a, a way to find compromises and look from other people's point of view. Uh, and unfortunately, I just don't know if we're ever gonna get to that point because passions are so inflamed and, and people are just frankly so pissed off. Mm -hmm. As a uh, presidential advisor, once you were with President George Bush at 41 or 43, if they happen to come confront a situation, would you want to advise them that one fact they are history already, a statue, a monument already, right? Well, look, it's not necessarily honor, honoring anybody. It's we, just, uh, just a I mean, we, we knock down monuments every day of the week in America. <laughs> that's not yeah, a, that's why, not a big deal. Why do that? Why do we do that? Well, For, there are a lot okay, of reasons why I'll we give do it. I'll, give, I'll give you an example. <laughs> the Great Wall of China, right? Yeah. Emperor Chang built it at the uh, taxpayers' money by suppression, by exploitation, by even killing people, so on and so forth, and is still there proudly standing China, whole China, not Emperor Chen. It's history, right? Yeah, but I mean, you have to understand that, you know, uh, first of all, the United States is only around 250 years old. Mm -hmm. So uh, our sense of history is way shorter than, say, the pyramids. <laughs> all right, okay. So, okay. you mm -hmm. know, the pyramids, you know, uh, or the Great Wall of China or right. the Colossus of Rhodes mm -hmm. or stuff like that, I mean, there are ancient wonders of the world. But in America, you know, monuments and markers, you know, for all intents and purposes, are, oh, see, are things see. that don't last, uh, unless you're Mount Rushmore or see, the I Washington see. Monument. Mm. But statues and, and stuff like that, we constantly take them down. Um, I see. All you have to do, for example, is go into Statuary Hall. Because we're young. Well, yeah, if you go into Statuary Hall in the Capitol Rotunda, every state in the Union is allowed to put two statues up of their choosing. Mm. Uh, and and there, there was a little minor controversy a lot of times with like a statue of some revered, um, you know, war veteran from like World War I is removed and a more contemporary statue is put mm. in there. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that we change monuments in America the way that we change fast food choices. Uh -huh. uh, that, uh -huh. that is kind of like part uh -huh. of what makes us Americans. Uh -huh. uh, we're not Europe uh, where we keep something up for 500 years. Uh, so I, I think in that regard, the, the idea of trying to embrace monuments as these unchanging, unyielding things is, is frankly a little facetious because, you know, we do change those monuments In constantly. other words, they, they should, or even I should, recognize it is more symbolized in the United States than in China, than in Egypt. Yeah, because, you know, the United, States is, the United States is a much different, much younger, much more vibrant history. Right. I mean, yeah. the, the fact of the matter is that you could have a statue of Robert E. Lee or even Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. in, a, in the middle of the city. And yeah. if that city were to decide, you know, we need to take the statue down, not for any political reasons, but because we want to put it in a high-rise hotel there, mm -hmm. then it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. so history in the United mm -hmm. States, especially in the West, for example, in California, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything older than maybe 25 years here that would qualify oh, as antique. See. See. So uh, it's, a, it's a very, very different attitude about monuments in the United I States see. than what you find elsewhere. All right. And uh, honestly, this is the first time to, for me to hear this kind of analysis. Uh, my dear audience, today I have the opportunity to have Honorable James Lee, former presidential advisor to President uh, George Bush and George H.W. Bush, 43 and the 41, and also former spokesman for California, former Governor Pete Wilson, now CEO and founder of uh, uh, Strategy, Lee Strategy. And I, 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 I like his uh, concept, and he's not a par par partisan that strong and he speaks uh, uh, amicably and also reasonably that I like, I believe. My audience, a lot of my audience, if you don't want to miss this, uh, you probably want to pay attention, of course, when it is uh, aired and re-aired and uh, on and on. And uh, by the way, we want to put it into writing and it is a thorough analysis. So let's take a short moment out. When we come back, we'll continue to find out what's wrong with the, with the nation is one thing, What's wrong with the media? I think when I say media, it uh, includes uh, uh, two, traditional media and social media. Okay. So, and who is doing what? Let's see, let's find out. All right, say with us, please.
Hello, dear folks, lovely folks. Welcome back to the show, my fellow uh, Americans. Uh, it is our own, own country we're talking about. It is our own backyard. Be it good, be it bad, it is on our cup of tea. Nobody else would uh, help us anymore. We want to help ourselves. We know a lot of good things are going on. We know that there is always a cure. We know the cure will work, and we need to work, work together. But we only can do it after a thorough analysis. For the analysis, I have my good friend, Honorable James Lee, come here to uh, help me untie the knots. There are lots of knots here. I get confused. Yeah, no, last week when I called you, I said, James, please help me. I'm in trouble. <laughs> because I receive uh, emails. In the email, they, t my audience, thank you, by the way, my, all of my audience take me as kind of like a knowing everything guy. Mm -hmm. Because I have friends, contacts I can call. They say they ask this, ask that, and all together I ask these questions that I ask you, like mm -hmm. that, representing them. Now, the the most most uh, frequently asked question by my uh, my uh, email writers, they say, now they have, we have the traditional media, right? We have the social media, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Somebody say, okay, okay, the traditional media tried their best. And then it is all the social media. You guys are messing yourself up. And the fact is, the traditional media gets a big chunk in the social media themselves. If you pick uh, your cell phone, you can find any newspaper, mm -hmm. uh, any TV stations there, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't say, hey, it's not our problem. What do you think? People, like last fr Friday, last Thursday, I had a conversation with a friend, uh, Ken Hamming. He strongly blames that it is the media made the fight the white supremacy. Mm -hmm. The white su supremacy is not a term, not a group, not a concept, not a bunch of a human there. It is a term that they made up. So I'm just giving you an example, not necessarily criticizing, criticizing him, all right? I'm talking about that. So, so he believes that the news media came up with the term white supremacy? Yeah, they came with a term. Okay. Yeah, it's not a, uh, is not a, a group, actual group there, okay? Right, or confederational group, all right, right, or neo-Nazi group. Mm -hmm. But I saw signs already, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, what's your comment well, about I, the media? Media I mean, w w with respect to, to that specific argument, mm -hmm. uh, that's simply not historically true. So mm -hmm. let, let's kind of put that aside for a second. Okay. Let's talk about the, the larger uh, change that's happened in America because mm -hmm. technology. All right. Technology has really altered radically how Americans consume media or how mm -hmm. anyone on the world consumes media. If you look at daily newspapers, for example, I mean, newspapers have almost gone the way of the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. uh, circulation is down everywhere. The papers themselves have shrunk. Several papers have yeah. Uh, gone out of existence. There are no afternoon newspapers left in America mm -hmm. where before every city had one. Uh, and, and part of that is, is economics. I mean, uh, a simple thing like Craigslist, for example, decimated uh, the classified market for newspapers and took away one of the biggest chunks of revenue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what you've seen is that there's been this big shift of money out of traditional media into non-traditional media. So that that's kind of like alter the landscape, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, the rise of smartphones has changed the way how we consume media before you'd buy a newspaper or you'd mm -hmm. sit in front of the television. Yeah. Now you can read the articles mm -hmm. with news alerts that come on your app and so forth or you watch newscasts. The, the real fundamental difference that's occurred though is that it's not just you know how you consume media on your phone and the phone, uh, the factor there, but really the now we can only read what we're interested in. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I picked up a newspaper, I got all the sections, front right. page, sports, oh, business, I see, so I forth. See. Uh -huh. But now when I have my phone, I can just set alerts. And for example, if I'm only interested in the Rams or the Dodgers, mm -hmm. that's the only alert I get. Uh, if I'm only interested in anti-Trump news, then that's the only news I get. So the, the problem now is that people more and more are only reading what they want to read and they're not being exposed to other voices. And that's been unfortunate because I think people are getting very, very siloed in the news they want. Mm. And the news media has responded to that desire for, for specialization mm -hmm. because now we have things like Fox News, 
we have MSNBC, mm -hmm. we have Fox Business News, we have CNBC. So the news is getting squished more and more into compartmentalized silos mm -hmm. where you can, if you're a anti-Trumper, then you go into MSNBC and you watch Rachel Maddow all day. Mm -hmm. If you're a pro-Trump supporter, you go into Fox News and you watch Sean Hannity. So the, the, the problem now is that, you know, and you see this in society now, where information becomes compartmentalized, the news becomes compartmentalized. People consume only what they want to see and read and mm -hmm. hear. And then when they hit the streets, they are regurgitating exactly the same uh, yeah, type of yeah, information. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's almost no crossover. Uh -huh. And when the crossover- and, they, and the ones they read, they read the kind of a fast food kind of thing. Well, yeah, once the crossover occurs, mm -hmm. then it's a clash and like it happens on Twitter and social media All and right. so forth. Uh -huh. And you get these, these really god awful debates yeah, on Facebook. people argue, they call you yeah. names. And, and I think the, the difficulty now is that because, you know, people, very few people will take the time to read, say, a 40 inch story story that has analysis and background on, mm -hmm. say, the history of race relations in America. Instead, we'll simply go ahead and talk about, well, the KKK is marching. So, you know, they're going to go ahead and talk about that. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is that, you know, going to your, your uh, other colleague's point, that white supremacy is kind of like this made-up fiction and there's mm -hmm. no really identified group, we really can't, in today's media, we can't scratch down below so people are looking for labels because they want to be able to quickly categorize things, whether or not it's an alt-right, alt-left, uh, social anarchist, progressive, uh, you know, uh, neo-Nazi, fascist. Uh -huh. um, you know, and the difficulty is that these labels f for a lot of people really don't mean a lot. I alluded to that before. Yeah. So you can call, if, for example, if you're a religious conservative mm -hmm. that opposes uh, abortion, for example, then you get labeled, you know, one thing. But then let's suppose that you are also objecting to illegal immigrants coming to America and having, mm -hmm. you know, kids mm -hmm. all the time. Well, then you get labeled another thing. So every layer of belief adds on another label to a point where we get this kind of caricature of, of certain people now where we say, well, that, that guy's a racist. And uh, I think that where we're going to end at the bottom of this stuff, at the end of the day, is that we're going to have an uncivil society where no one really can talk to e any, anybody else. In other words, the media problem is not only the media stand, the media concept. It is the media itself as a technology. Yeah. And that forms the, the fact that we have the reading habit changed. Well, yeah. The tradition of reading changed. Yeah, right? yeah. You have to think that technology has driven a lot of different alterations in. I mean, cord cutting, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, before you used to have three networks, uh, then four networks. Now you have almost no networks mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. anybody can get information or shows on demand. Mm -hmm. uh, I can go to Netflix. I can go to Hulu. I can go to Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's really no reason for me to ever go back to ABC or NBC and watch a network oh, anymore. Yeah. And I think that that's reflected in the ratings. I mean, before, you know, a, a blockbuster rating was to have maybe 40, 50 million people watching a show. Now a blockbuster rating is to have 10 million people <laughs> watch yeah, a show. Okay, that's really true. So sure. the, the scale uh -huh. of, of, um, of people and, and their viewing habits has changed mm -hmm. so radically, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that, that that also has contributed to a larger problem, which is that the attention span mm -hmm. of most Americans is like that big now. And because it's so small, uh, no one really wants to spend a lot of time thinking about anything. They just want to digest you're right, you're right, you're right, it and then spit right, it back out. And then after all, well, was there a cure for this problem? You know, honestly, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, the <laughs> it's... Uh, it, <laughs> I'm kind of a cure guy looking, at, it, looking around for cure. It's kind of a disturbing trend. There was mm -hmm. a very interesting sociological study that was recently mm -hmm. uh, done by some social behavioral experts. And they asked a, a simple question of a, a control group of people. And they, they gave them a specific problem, and their job was to go online and Google and look for an answer. Oh, I see. And they asked people if they f how smart they felt before they did this test, mm -hmm. and then they asked people how felt they smart fe how smart mm -hmm. they felt after they did uh, the test. Uh, okay. So you know, people might have said, "I'm an okay smart guy," but after they successfully found uh, an item, they ranked themselves as being really smart. Right. And the problem is that. You know, we don't, we don't teach or retain information anymore. We are teaching kids, especially, 
that, you know, we don't want you to learn anything. We want you to learn how to find something. Mm -hmm. And it's a difference between knowing a fact and searching for a fact. Yeah. And the problem now is that I think we're, we're basically turning Americans into large consumers uh, and, and, and search engines but not really knowing a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's really kind of dangerous as a It's kind of a negative encouragement. Well, it's dangerous right. that if we don't understand context and history, mm -hmm. then you're, you're almost always going to repeat your mistakes. Yeah, you're right, you're right. And, you're and right. That's, that's a little bit of the problems we're going right. through. I mean, I think for a lot of people who grew up in the 60s, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that we're, they must be living a little bit of deja vu. With yeah, the that's why of people my age worried a lot, yeah. right, or a lot. All right, we're over time, but uh, I still want to continue. Oh, I wish I could. Uh, with my good friend, the Honorable James Lee, former presidential advisor for George W. Bush, George Bush, 43 and 41, and a former California Governor Wilson as his uh, spokesman, uh, we had this wonderful time. I really, really, really super appreciate the fact that uh, there are lots of statements I heard for the first time over several issues, and I would like to uh, uh, to remind you, you want to pay attention to the air and the rear, air, and I, we would uh, put a discussion into an article on magazine so you can later on always find it. So thank you very much, my dear audiences. Uh, thank you, uh, sir, for oh, sharing sure, your no beautiful mind. All right.